Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd simply quicken this portion of your word. It's your word, not ours. We are yours, not our own. And we pray that you would quicken this portion of truth unto our poor souls, that we might eat and be satisfied as of old on the shores of Galilee when they ate in full. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things out of your law. We, we feel like David said, our soul is crushed with longing after your ordinances at all times. We long for your word. We count, Lord, we consider, Lord, that when we find something new and precious from your word, it's more than if we'd found thousands of silver and gold pieces. We rejoice over it as one who finds great spoil. The Lord, we pray that you would bless, bless your word unto us. He said, great peace have those who love your law, and nothing shall cause them to stumble. We pray, Father, as we do love your law, give us more of it, Lord, that we might know more of the peace that's beyond understanding, the love that's beyond knowing, the joy that's beyond speaking. We pray, quicken us, Lord, and quicken thy word unto us today, that we might live in your sight, for we are but strangers, we are but pilgrims, we are but sojourners, only here for a little while. We pray that we might live and do our utmost for your high and holy name. So come, Lord, and breathe upon the sacred page. Yes, beyond the sacred page, we seek thee, Lord. Come and do bless. Give your word success and quicken it, that we might eat, Lord, our eyes would be brightened like Jonathan of old. And praise your name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, literally redeeming the time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I would like to speak today on the preciousness of time and the importance of redeeming it. I can do no better than to borrow the title from Jonathan Edwards. The Preciousness of Time and the Importance of Redeeming It. The Bible specifically says some things are precious, right? It speaks, it says, unto you who believe. He is precious. We've been redeemed, not with corruptible things, but with incorruptible, the precious blood of Christ, and again, exceeding great and precious promises, and again, those who have, have obtained a like precious faith, and again, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. It specifically says, some things are precious. I assert today that the scripture teaches that time is precious. Time is precious. It must be because we're here commanded to redeem it. We're here commanded to buy it up, to buy it back, out of the court, out of the economy, out of the market, out of the shop of the devil, to buy it back from him. God is implying, surely, that time is precious. Four things to speak on here. Number one, the essence of time. Number two, the why time is precious. And number three, how to redeem time as though it were precious. And number four, some closing exhortations regarding the preciousness of time. So number one, the essence of time. Time, at least it seems to me, is a mystery. It's beyond me, too wonderful for me, too high, I cannot explain it. You look it up in the dictionary, and as I understood it, really there wasn't a definition in the dictionary. I mean, it described it, but it didn't define it. Who can define it? I mean, what is time? What happens between second number one and second number two? Who says that we've got to be subject to this thing we call the clock? Who says that tomorrow is tomorrow, and next year I'll be a year older? What do we mean when we say, I don't have time? or I wasted time. I'll do it if I have time. What is this thing we call time? Time, it seems so normal to us, doesn't it? It seems so normal, but yet, really it's not. I mean, time wasn't always around. 
What was there before God created the heavens and the earth? Was it God plus time? Not at all. Before heaven and earth were created, there was nothing there but God, the eternal God. It says in Isaiah, Thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. He is the everlasting, the eternal God. No time with him, the same yesterday, today, and forever. No time involved with him. The psalmist, in chapter 90, verse 1, he starts out, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place from all generations before you gave birth to the world, or the mountains, or the hills, from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. No time with him. He's beyond time. And so really, we can hardly say that time is normal. I mean, from all eternity, there wasn't time until just this little space right here. We can't really say at what point in time did God create the heavens and the earth because there was no point in time. There was no time before God created it. I believe he created the heavens and the earth with time. He created it, he'll terminate it. We don't know how to define it, but we do know that it's a principle like gravity that God has established in the universe. We can measure time, we measure time, well, that is our days by the rotation of the earth. Genesis chapter 1. The first night, evening, and, and morning was the first day. The second evening and morning was the second day. So we measure our days. God created that measurement of time. And the earth around the sun, we measure our years. It doesn't seem like it has anything to do with death because before the fall and before death entered, there was time. Death terminates our time. It seems like it has something to do with change because it, if everything were absolutely still in the whole universe, at least you couldn't measure time. Well, while we cannot define it, yet for sure it's a principle that God has established that nobody can resist. The songwriter says, Time like an ever-rolling stream bears all its sons away. So time... I assert it's precious and we're commanded to redeem it. Why is time precious? Secondly, we have one reason presented us right here in the scriptures and this here uh, text, context. It says, making the most of your time, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Six reasons why time is precious. First reason is that days are evil. Not only do we have evil days, you know, I had a bad day last week. Not only do we have evil days, uh, like Ephesians 6.13, it says that you may be able to stand in the evil day, you know, special attacks of the devil. Not only do we have evil days, but I believe this is saying right here in 5.16, that the whole of the days of our life are evil in general, that this world, the time, the age, the period, this world is evil. The days are evil. The days of our life are evil. Jacob, he had it right when he stood before Pharaoh in chapter 47 of Genesis, verse 9. Pharaoh said, how old are you? In so many words. And Jacob said, he says, the days of the years of my sojourning are 130. Few and what? Few and evil are the days of my years of my life. And Job, he had it right too in chapter 14, verse 1. He says, man who is born of a woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. And Eliphaz had it right too in chapter 5, verse 7 of Job. He says, man, he uh, is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. Born for trouble as sparks fly upward. You know, it's just natural for sparks to fly upward. And so, it seems that evil, trouble, suffering, natural in our life. What man is there whose life has not been characterized by sickness, by pain, by danger, by accidents, sufferings, both inward and outward? Psalm 90 verse 10 says, our, The days of our years are... Three score and ten, seventy years, or if due to strength they are eighty years, yet even their pride is labor and sorrow. And so finally death comes. The days are evil. Think of it, children. 
If you don't become a Christian, if you don't become united to Christ, there's nothing to look forward to in this world. That's what this is saying. The days are evil. Parents, if you bring your children into the world and you fail to bring them to Christ, you've done them no service. They've been better than never been born. I mean, I'm not talking about just hell. If a person miss, misses Christ and never saved him, I'm not talking about just hell, but even in this world, the days are evil and be better than never been born. And I told my mother when she was dying with cancer, Mom, there is not one word of encouragement for you or anybody unless you're united to Christ. Somebody might say, well, what do you mean? I'm 70 years old. I've never been in a hospital. You know, life hasn't been that bad for me. I'll tell you why it hasn't been that bad for him or why he doesn't think it's that bad for him is because the devil has blinded his mind to even see the suffering he ought to feel. The whole age, the period, this world is under the dominion of the evil one. And any man or society or civilization left to itself is going to go evil. It's going to serve the devil. And so we must redeem it. It must be bought back. It must be redeemed. It must be worked for, fought for, wrestled away from the devil. His system and his power. Do you have this worldview? Is that your worldview? Of course, the world hates it. It would hate that kind of a worldview. What do you mean, the, uh, the days are evil? What kind of an attitude is that? What kind of an outlook is that? Well, you see, Christianity has 100% bad news and 100% good news. With a good, you, you know, it's 100% good news if you come to Jesus. But do you have this worldview? Or is it happy-go-lucky? Kick up your heels. Get all the gusto you can. This world's a playground. Or do you see it as a battleground? It has to be redeemed because the days are evil. It's got to be bought back, huh? wrestled back, redeemed out of the hands of the evil one. That's the first reason why time is precious and must be redeemed. A second reason that time is precious and must be redeemed is because the quantity of time is small. Implied by the words here in verse 16, because the days are evil. It doesn't say millennia. It doesn't say years. It doesn't say months. It says days. The quantity is small is the implication. Think of it, brethren. If we live to be 70 years of age, that right there times 365 is only 25,550 days. 25,000 some days. I mean, it's not millennia. It's not centuries and centuries. It's just a few thousand days. I mean, you can conceive of it in your mind. It's not a great lot. It's not a great number. It's just a few thousand days. It's all you have if you live to 70. Not a million, not a billion. It's gone, Job says, and we fly away. If something is really small in quantity, that makes it precious, right? Why is gold precious? Why are gems precious? It's because they're so small in quantity. You, you might pull into the gas station and grumble about the price of gas at a dollar. But if you were out in the desert and ready to die and you needed a gallon or a five, somebody came along with a five-gallon gas can, well, you would gladly dump your billfold for that five-gallon of gas. It'd be precious for you if that quantity of gas you had at your uh, availability was small. You remember back there in Kings, in the days of Elisha, there was a famine in the land, and a donkey's head, who wants to eat a donkey's head, was sold for 80 shekels of silver. Why? Because the quantity of food available was so small. That makes it precious. Come with me for a little tour through the book of Job. Job chapter 7, verse 6. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuffle. A weaver shuttle, just zing, zing, back and forth like that. And chapter 8, verse 9. For we are only of yesterday and know nothing. 
because our days on earth are as a shadow. Yesterday, when I came out here, uh, after breakfast, I looked out, there was the shadow of the chapel going way down there by the woods. And I went in to study for a while, and I came back out a little later, and here there wasn't any shadow at all. That's like our life. Chapter 9, 25. Now my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. They see no good. You might look out, and, and there's a runner pacing down the road, running down the road, and you'll see him going by, and it looks so slow, just pod, pod, podding along, you know. But you turn your back, you do something, you come back, and here the runner's gone. You can't even see him. 14, 2, and 6. Like a flower, he comes forth and withers. He also flees like a shadow and does not remain. Like a flower, the classic illustration of the brevity of life. A flower which looks so beautiful today and tomorrow is withered. And how about down here in verse 6? Until he fulfills his day like a hired man. Here's a landowner. He's got a job to do. It need, we need to get it done today. He goes to the marketplace. He sees some people standing idle down there. And he, and he says, would you help me today? I need to get this job done. And so, uh, you know, he goes out, this man, he goes to work. And it seems like a long day at the time, hard work. But just like that, the day's over. He fulfills his day like a hired man. He's all gone. The work is done. And then Psalms 39, verse 4. Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. Let me really see it. What's the answer? Behold, thou hast made my days as handbreadths. How wide is your hand? Not very wide. As handbreadths. Well, he, he says, in my lifetime, yet as nothing in thy sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Surely every man walks about as a phantom, an image, a ghost. You know, like somebody sees a, I thought I saw something over there, but it's gone, like a ghost. And in 90, verse 4, or 5. Thou hast swept them, the generations away, like a flood, they fall asleep. In the morning they are like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening it fades and withers away. I suppose there is a kind of grass or a flower that it, it, it just grows in one day's time and withers in the same day. Just like a man. So brief is his life. Many, we could multiply the illustrations of the brevity of man's life. We hardly need to turn to that famous one in James chapter 4. He says, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while, like your breath on a cold morning, and vanishes away, you see it no more. The brevity of man's life, it's now or never, dear friends, now or never. It's now or never that you become a Christian, now or never that you lay up treasure in heaven. Time is so precious and must be redeemed because it is so small. One life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. A third reason that time is so precious and must be redeemed is because the quantity of time is spent so rapidly. Not only is it small, but it slips away so fast. I mean, I might illustrate it this way. If somebody, if you are captives, and they put you in a room, and they say, we're going to give you this one bucket of water, that's all you got. And lo and behold, you looked at that bucket of water, and here it had a leak. And it was dripping, but the leak, the drip wasn't very fast, just one every few hours. It wouldn't concern you much. But if that thing was leaking fast, you would be mightily concerned. And so with time, it slips away so fast. Think of it. For myself, I was only six years older than Nathan is now when I first met Bob and Joanne. My dad was only 15 years older than I am now when he uh, sold a farm. My mother, only 19 years older than me, when she died. The sands of time are sinking. 
A fourth reason that time is precious and must be redeemed is because the quantity of time is unknown. Not only is it small, but we don't know how small it is. Not only is it short, but we don't know how short it is. I mean, like, for example, when our neighbor came over and told us that his well had run dry, we knew that the water uh, supply must be short. We'd heard of others, uh, wells running dry. Now here our neighbor, he tells us his runs dry. So we not only know that the quantity is small, but we don't know how small it is, and so that we don't know but what the next gallon might be the last gallon of water. And so it was very precious for us. We were careful how we flushed the toilets and this and that. It was precious to us because we didn't know how small it was. If we'd known that we had a thousand gallons, well, it'd be indifferent, but we didn't know how small it was. And so you see with time, you don't know how much time you've got. The quantity you've got is not only small, not only slipping away fast, but you don't know how much you've got. And you see, what utter arrogance for any man to think that he's got tomorrow. James, he says, he says, uh, all that boasting is evil. You who say today or tomorrow will go into such and such city, will live there, will buy, will sell, will get gain. He says, that, uh, that, all that boasting is arrogance and it's evil. Proverbs 27, 1. Don't boast about tomorrow. You don't know what a day may bring forth. Ecclesiastes 9.12, it says man, di man dies not knowing his time. Like a fish caught in the treacherous snare, like a bird caught in the snare, or a fish caught in the treacherous net, like a bird caught in the snare, so the sons of men are ensnared in an evil time, so suddenly it falls on them. Man doesn't know his time, like a fish is caught, like a bird is caught, suddenly he's taken away. Same with man. We don't know how long we've got. Every day is a gift from God. Every day you've had is a gift from God. You don't know you've got tomorrow. It's a gift if it comes. A fifth reason that time is precious and should be redeemed is because this time, it can never be recovered. It's a commodity that can never be recovered. I mean, you might lose your coat and buy back a better one. You might lose your estate like Job and get more back, even that. But who is able to get the time back? Not the Pope, not the pastor, not the president, not your parents as much as they care. No, not even God is going to give your time back. It's gone, everlastingly gone. The world is passing away and the loss thereof. It's all gone and it can't come back. And then we die and Job says, I go the way of no return. A sixth reason that time is precious and must be redeemed is because the time right now that we have, it determines our eternal destiny. The time we've got determines our eternity. That's why it's so precious. I mean, some things, you can de are de their worth is determined by their buying power or by the effect or the power that they have. For example, when I went to buy a lawnmower, I checked at Sears. They have the 30-inch mower in three different styles or sizes. They had an 8-horse, 10-horse, and 12-horse motor. The 12-horse and the 10-horse was worth more than the 8-horse. Why? Because it could do more, had more power. A president is paid more than congressman because he's got more power. Gold is worth more. I mean, if I had a choice between gold and silver, I'd take the gold because it does more. Marriage is more important than where I live. Why? Because the ramifications are greater. And so here, these few days that we got, it'll determine our eternal destiny, heaven or hell. Not only heaven or hell, but also if we are a Christian, it'll determine the degree of reward that we have. I mean, you read the parable of the talents in Luke chapter 19. Those who are faithful now who are given authority then and the hereafter. Oh, listen, if we're going to get in the kingdom of God, it's going to have to be now. Time is precious and must be redeemed. Let's take every fleeting moment, every flying minute, and give it something to keep in store. A third point that I would like to bring out now is how to redeem the time as though it were precious. How to redeem it as though it were precious. The answer is given here, one answer in general, the overall answer right in our text. Ephesians 5, it says... <clears throat> Therefore, be careful how you walk. 
or literally, look carefully how you walk. The King James translates it, walk circumspectly. Circum meaning around, and spect meaning look. So you're to walk, you know, looking around, looking around. It's the picture of somebody walking down a path. There's snares, there's pits, there's snakes, there's danger. And so walk carefully. Be careful how you walk. Look around. Don't be sloppy. Don't be silly. Don't be foolish. Don't hit or miss. But look carefully how you walk. Consider the consequences. Try to get neutral in it. And say, Lord, what is your will? I want to understand what your will is. I want to be wise in this thing. I don't want to be foolish and make mistakes and slip and perish. Be careful how you walk. Not sloppy, but watch your path. So there's the overall answer. Or to put it about another way, he says, not as unwise men. In other words, not as a fool. And so it is with a non-Christian. I mean, the non-Christian. What a fool. He wasted his whole life. Isn't it amazing that this quantity that is most precious, people treat it most wastefully. They're most prodigal with a commodity that is most precious. They waste their lives and treat their most precious thing as though it were nothing. Like in back in the days of Solomon when they treated silver like stones. So he says, not as fools. We as Christians, we must be careful because we can make foolish decisions that will really cost us, that will hurt us. That will rob us of whole periods of our life. Redeeming the time. How? By walking not as fools, not as fools, but as wise. We can make foolish decisions that will cost us. Foolish decisions regarding our career. I remember one time getting a letter from a brother. And he was regretting this very thing. A foolish decision regarding his career. He said, why? Why all the days, months, years of treading water? He'd made foolish decisions, he felt, regarding his career. Marriage, we can make foolish decisions. I mean, when, think of it, when a woman commits herself to a man, she is saying, my, she is committing her whole life to him, and a man to the woman, and how much of their lives, their days, are going to be affected by the person they marry. Buying and selling decisions. One car I bought especially. What a foolish decision it was. It cost time in repairs. It cost money in repairs. It bugged me. It bothered me. It cost hardships. You know, it wasted time. It didn't redeem the time. Buying and selling decisions are so important. Kurt Baker. I mean, he's down to his last dollar. He's just trying to scrape by in a pots and pans job. Washing pots and pans. And he was telling me the last time he was down, he got tired of cooking for himself. He was going to go out and eat. And then when he got to thinking, hold it. If it cost me uh, $7 or whatever he said to go out to eat, that means I'm going to have to work almost two hours at the pots and pans to earn that money back. And he didn't go out to eat. You see, your time, your money is time, and your time is your life. So be careful with your buying and selling decisions. Not as fools, but as wise is the next phrase. But as wise... The scripture speaks of uh, two builders. One is wise, one is foolish. Ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. Wise. We need wisdom to see the priorities in life. To see the priorities in life. Lord, I've got to have this in my life and I insist. I insist to myself, I'm going to get it. I'm going to incorporate this in my life no matter what. It's got to be. It's a priority thing and I've got to have this in my life. You know, the Lord gives us he gives us a real clear word on what ought to be top priority for the Christian. He says, Martha, Mary has chosen the good part. He, he says only a few things are necessary, really only one. And Martha, Mary has chosen a good part that will not be taken away. What did she choose? She was listening to the word of God. Bible reading, Bible meditation is top priority for the man of God, for the woman of God, for the young person. And meditate on the words and know this book like the back of your hand. Don't be deceived by the devil. And go through life not knowing the word of God. He, the devil is going to come and he's going to give you this, that, and the other. Every kind of thing to keep you from meditating on the word of God. It doesn't matter whether you're retired or what you're doing. You might not have any children to care for. 
And the devil's going to come and give you a thousand and one distractions that keep you from the good part, from the priority business, knowing the word of God, being mighty in the scriptures, like Apollos. I'll tell you another thing that is top priority for the Christian. We're talking about wisdom to see the top priorities. And that's in Colossians chapter 4. Interesting that this same phrase, redeeming the time, is used here in the book of Colossians. Chapter 4, verse 5. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. In other words, redeeming the time, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt, so that you may know how to should respond to each person. Verse 5, toward outsiders. Verse 6, how to respond to each person. In other words, the outsider. In other words, it's talking about soul winning. Talk, and it's talking about walking in wisdom and seeing opportunities to speak of Christ, to lead men to Christ, to point them to Christ, to put a word in season. Making the most of the opportunity. There are opportunities to talk about the Lord uh, that don't occur at other times. The other day, a man came out with a lumber truck to deliver it. And here, you know, here, I, uh, he got, uh, we unloaded the lumber, he got back in the truck, and it dawned on me. I, I, I didn't even think about considering an opportunity to share with him Christ. And, and I went back to his door and I said, did you say you used to live out here? Yeah. And so the conversation started developing and I got an opportunity to speak of the Lord to him. There are certain opportunities. We, we ought to be like uh, merchants going around looking for bargains, looking for opportunities, you know, to speak of the Lord to souls and bring them in to Christ, to remind them of the claims of Christ. When my dad, when my mother was dying, that was an opportunity to speak to my dad about the Lord in eternity that I've never had before or since. When he moved over to the South Grand House in 83, I had opportunities to talk with the neighbors that I never had after that. Opportunities, two big priorities, is reading the word and winning souls, walking in wisdom toward the outsiders. Then he goes on in Ephesians chapter 5 to put it another way. Not as fools, not as unwise, but as wise. And what's the next phrase? Understand what the will of the Lord is. Down there in verse 17. In other words, not always missing the will of God. There is a time, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, a time for this and a time for that. We don't want to always be saying, oh, I blew it there, I missed the Lord's will there. But, but rather understanding the Lord's will. Lord, I can see this is your will here and here. And so walking and making wise decisions and the little things of life. But I think really the, oh, the, there's the larger application of this phrase, understanding what the will of the Lord is, and that is through walking with God in experience, through reading the word of God, we would have then the mind of the Lord and just see what his overall plan is for our life and for the Christian, the overall will for the Christian. Standing perfect and complete in all the will of God. Lord, I see this is how a man, this is how a Christian ought to conduct his life. This is the major thrust that you would have for a man or a woman or a young person. How you'd have him to spend his days and so entering into that. How to redeem the time? Walk carefully. Look around. Walk circumspectly. Don't be a fool. Be wise, understand the will of God. In closing, does this speak to you? It speaks to the slothful. The slack in hand is a brother to him who destroys. It ought to speak to the idle. Jesus said we're going to have to give an account for every idle word. Well, surely then also every idle moment. It ought to speak to the sleeper. I mean, we might be Christians and sleepy Christians. Romans 13, it says, And that do, knowing the time, knowing the time, that the night is far spent and the day is at hand, our salvation is nearer than when we believe. Look, he says, you're closer to salvation, you're closer to glorification, full salvation, than when you first believe. The day is at hand, the night is far spent. How inconsistent to be sleepy when the big day is upon you. 
Get up, wake up. That's what he's saying in Romans 13, 11. Get out, get out, put off the unfruitful deeds of darkness. Get out of that sin. Get out of that sin that drags you down. Get out of that sin that stupefies you and put on the armor of light. Get ready for the big day, the day of the Lord. It ought to speak to those who love amusements and entertainments. You look at those things. I mean, when you come back, you don't have anything good. It didn't do anything good for your soul. It didn't even do anything good for your body. Nothing good for your neighbor. Nothing good for your family. Nothing good for your church. Nothing good for your bod. It ought to speak to the man who is lazy. Laziness cast into a deep sleep. Proverbs 19.15 It ought to speak to the talkative. Proverbs 14.23 In all labor there is profit. But much talk leads to poverty. Just talking and talking and talking and never doing it. Never getting at it. Never digging in. Beating around the bush. Procrastinating. Talk. It leads to poverty. It ought to speak to the sinful. Here's a man. He's not lazy. I mean, he's zealous. Boy, he's busy. But the thing of it is, he's busy for the wrong thing. He's busy in sin. He's doing the wrong thing. Not only is he not doing a positive, but he's doing a negative. He's digging his grave deeper. He's writing his sentence harder and taking others with him. It ought to speak to the worldly minded. Maybe you know there's, there's, nothing wrong with, uh, there's nothing wrong with your job. There's nothing wrong with having a wife. There's nothing wrong with, with uh, 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 getting money in the bank account. Nothing wrong with those things. But if you're worldly minded uh, and not pursuing Christ, it's trouble. What I mean is God wants us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Priority, balance. Make sure that our affections on, are on things above, not on things of the, of the earth. In Luke 12, there was that rich farmer. There was nothing wrong with being a rich farmer, but the only problem was he wasn't rich part God. And so God said, you fool, you're, this night your soul shall be required of you. Don't be a fool, but why is redeeming the time, redeeming the days of your life. I urge you, brethren, that make decisions in view of eternity. Make decisions in view of eternity. Do you believe it? I mean, consider yourself a pilgrim of eternity. Peter says, conduct yourself in fear during the time of your stay upon the earth. A little stay upon the earth. Conduct yourself in fear. Don't be a fool and fret it away. Listen to the words of Paul, 1 Corinthians 7. He says, let those who have wives be as though they had none. Why? Because the form of this world is passing away. I am convinced the reason there's so many books out on the Christian, Christian market today about family is, is this. They're not doing well with God. They're not living for eternity. And that's why there's all this little nitpicky junk going on between husband and wife, because they're not living for God. Let those who have wives be laws as though they have none, for the world is passing away. Listen to the words of Jesus. Matthew 6, 19, he says, Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moss and rust corrupts, where thieves will break through and steal, but lay up treasure in heaven, the bank of heaven. Pass it on, get it up there. Lay up treasure in heaven. I mean time. It's like a talent that God has given us to trade with. Do business with that time. Make decisions that will count for eternity. Giving, praying, fasting. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. There's only two eternal things on earth. The souls of men and the word of God. Make decisions that will count for eternity. I urge you to make decisions that will improve your soul then. Jude says, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Building your soul up. You realize the only thing that you can take from this life into the next is your soul, your character. The soul and the improvements you've made upon it. That is your character. Yes, God wants us to care for our body. We're not to despise the body. We sure don't. I mean, that's why we put in eight hours a day at work. 
is so we can earn some money, so we can buy some food, so we can feed the body and put a roof over our head and for our family. I mean, it, why Richard doesn't owe Price Chopper uh, nothing? Bob doesn't owe the soil anything. Alan doesn't owe them anything. You don't have to go to work. The only reason to go to work is for that paycheck. I mean, if it wasn't for the paycheck, I wouldn't go there, right? Why well, beat your feet off down there at the Price Chopper? The thing you're looking for is that paycheck. Now, if you do well and serve as unto the Lord, you'll get a reward for the holiness with which you've done your job. But what I'm saying is this. Don't make your job your big thing. That'll, that's in the background there. The big thing is your pursuit of Jesus and the improvement of your soul. Of course, the Christian can do two things at his job. Not only can he get the paycheck, but he can also improve his soul as he's sensitive and walks with the Lord through that job. But you see, the Bible puts the emphasis on the soul. 1 Timothy 4.8, he says, bodily exercise, it profits little. So go ahead and do just a little exercise. It'll profit you some, but do a little. But he says, godliness, in other words, the soul is profitable for everything, for it holds a promise for this present time and also for the time to come. Godliness, that's the thing you ought to zero in on. That's the thing you ought to specialize in. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, the outer man is perishing, but the inner man is being renewed day by day. How do you improve your soul? One of the chief ways of reading. What are you reading? Are you reading things that will edify, will build you up, will improve your soul? The Word of God, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance. Good books, able to build you up. I'll tell you one good test for the quality of what you're reading. And that is, after you've done reading it, do you have anything you can impart to anybody else? Do you have anything you can share with anybody? If you come away from that book or newspaper or whatever you've read and you don't have anything to impart, what good did it do? It must have not been very real to you if you can't even share anything with anybody else. It'll amount to anything. George Mueller, he says, I don't let a day go by, but what I've had a good time over the Word of God. I urge you to beware of making soft choices, soft decisions. Ecclesiastes 8.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Doesn't sound like soft stuff. Get at it. Mark Spitz, I read, I read that he swam 26,000 miles preparing for the 1972 Olympics at which he won seven gold medals, 26,000 miles. And they do it for a corruptible crown. We, for an incorruptible, how much more ought we to get at it? He says, and Timothy, take pains with these things. Take pains with these things that your progress may be apparent to all. Get at it, like the Olympic athlete. Take it that seriously, and even more. I mean, we're just talking reality. If you say this seems fanatical, I'll tell you why. It's because you're deceived. In a measure, you're deceived. You don't see reality the way you are. You don't see a part of the way you are. You don't see the brevity of our life the way you are. I'll tell you why he spends 26,000 miles preparing for the Olympics. It's because he's deceived. He's going for the wrong goal. And sad to say that the children of darkness are wiser in their generation than the children of light. Oh, oh, that we could wake up to the reality of this thing, or the preciousness of time, and the importance of redeeming it. Make schedules where you can. Make schedules where you can. It'll help you. I urge you to number your days. That's what it says in Psalm 90, the eternity of God, the brevity of man. How does he conclude it? He says, Oh, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Number your days like a schoolboy waiting to get out of school. We've got ten days left of school. Number your days. Make them count. That important in your own eyes. Consider that your time is short. Consider that you've wasted so much time. If you're a Christian, take the attitude that Peter says and say, the time past of my life is sufficient for me to have brought the will of the Gentiles. I'm done with it. I want to get on in the things of God. I want to go as far as I can in the race of life before God blows a whistle. Times of your life, namely your youth. Listen, children, your youth. Let me read it. 
and Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 10. So remove vexation from your heart. He's talking to the young man. Remove vexation from your heart. Put away evil from your body. Get rid of that sin. Get turned from sin. Get rid of sin and start seeking the Lord. Because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. And then he says in that famous verse, chapter 12, verse 1, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come. And you'll say, I've got no pleasure in them. Wheelchair. Can't remember like I used to. Remember your Creator now, children, in the days of your youth. Seek the Lord. I urge you. I urge you to deal with sin. And don't procrastinate in dealing with sin. Put it off. Put it off now. It says in Corinthians, today is the day of salvation. Today is the accepted time. I mean, you don't have yesterday. It's gone. You don't have tomorrow. It's not here. Today is the day of salvation. He will sin now. Put it off. Get right with God now. Make sure that you know that your sins are forgiven, that you've got a title to heaven to the blood of the Lamb. It says, today if you'll hear his voice and not harden your heart. Today, today, today. I wonder how many times in the Bible the word today is written. It's the days of salvation. Today. Get at it. I urge you to hear the voice of those in hell. Why are they weeping and gnashing of teeth? I have no doubt one reason that they're weeping and gnashing their teeth in hell is because of regret. They're sad, they're sorry. They regret the fact that they wasted their lives. And the time is gone. Will you hear the voice of the devil for what it is? The devil is saying to you who are young, don't do it now, there's always another day. I've got a whole life to live. The devil is saying to you who are older, to the old, He's saying, you blew it, you wasted your life, and now it's too late. No sense trying even now. Will you listen to those on their deathbed? That famous Voltaire, that noted infidel, that skilled writer that he was, the way he used his pen for the devil. He said, he said, with my hand, I'm going to tear down the edifice that, it took, that the twelve apostles built. And he says, in 20 years, we're going to exterminate Christianity. But when it came to his deathbed, he cried out. He said, I'd give you half of all I own if you'd give me another six months to live. He wanted time. And the nurse that stood at his bedside, he says, I wouldn't. I would not for all the wealth of Europe want to see another infidel die. He regretted, see, that he'd lost his life. Here's another man by the name of William Polk. He was a leader of a band of people and it was one of their practices to kick the Bible around on the floor. And when it came to his deathbed, what does he say? He says, I cannot repent. The day of grace is past. I, you're looking at one who is damned forever. Oh, eternity, eternity. And those who saw his death, they said it was a scene of terror. We you listen to the voice of the prophets? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And again, I hasten and did not delay to keep thy commandments. We will listen to the voice of creation. Creation, it says in Romans 8, is groaning, 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 waiting for the great day of God when the sons of God will be revealed. Creation is groaning, chains and decay, and all around I see everything I look at. It says things are running down. Eternity is upon us. We are listening to the voice of your own conscience. It says in Ecclesiastes 3, God has set eternity in the hearts of the sons of men. It's written in your heart that eternity is coming. Listen to the voice of your conscience. What have you done with your days? What have you done with your years? Your seasons? What have you done? So much of your life has been wasted and passed. If God called you an account right now, how would you stand? Listen to your own conscience. I urge you to listen to Jesus. John chapter 9, verse 4. He says, we, not I, we must work the works of him who sent me. Follow his day, for night is coming when man can work no more. That phrase, and man can work no more. Night's coming. If you listen to the voice of Jesus now, I'll guarantee you, 
you'll hear his voice then in that great day. Well done, good and faithful servant. And again, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, for they shall rest and their deeds will follow them. And then time shall be no more. No more time. Eternity is ushered in. May God help us to redeem the time and consider it precious. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their deeds shall follow them. Could we sing number 161 in the American hymnal? 